Okay, so um, since h bar is very small, then h bar squared is very, very small. And so the lowest energy state is actually very, very small in energy, very small energy. And so, um, so even though the uh, quantum mechanically the particle can't have zero energy, the lowest ener energy state is in fact very, very, has, is uh, very, very low. Okay. Um, so the states with n equals, uh, with higher uh, quantum numbers, n equals 2, 3, 4, etc., are called excited states. And you can imagine, like we talked about in the Bohr atom, you can have transitions um, between these discrete states, um, which can give rise to photon emission or photon absorption. Okay. Um, and um, here's where we're going to, here, if we think about a macroscopic particle, sort of a classical particle, um, in a macroscopic sized box, that is where L is not equal to some, you know, very small dimension, like not in the nanometer range, but maybe in the, mi in the millimeter range or bigger, then the energy of the, in a, in a, for a classical particle, the mechanical energy in, uh, in the region of the box where the potential energy is equal to zero is just equal to the kinetic energy, P squared over 2M. And that is much, much e uh, bigger than the, um, than the um, uh, lowest, the, the, the ground state energy, h bar squared pi squared over 2 ml squared. And if you look at this, then that means that the momentum of the particle is much, much bigger than h bar pi over L. And so what this implies is that the quantum number n is very, very large. Okay, it's very, it's very much bigger than one, which means that, again, the probability density, star, psi star psi, has a very large number of nodes and antinodes, okay? So it wiggles a lot, and those antinodes are very, very close together, and the probability density is approximately uniform um, because uh, if the if the distance between the antinodes is smaller than any um, is much much smaller than than um, than sort of what can be measured or detected, then uh, then then again you sort of average out uh, these. Uh, nodes and antinodes, these wiggles, and it looks and it looks uniform, which is which agrees with the classical prediction. And again, this is called the correspondence principle. Okay, and it's an important principle in quantum mechanics. And we'll get back to it, but we'll mention it here. The correspondence principle. Okay. Um, and so now we can want now we can um, uh, write the um, the full form of the wave function by bringing in the time dependence. Remember the wave function is the is the uh, the time independent part root 2 over L sine kn of x times the uh, time evolving part e to the minus i omega t and there should be a little um, there should be a little n um, to denote that these frequencies depend on the on the um, uh, on the quantum number, because remember uh, e sub n is also equal to h bar omega n. Okay, and so if we basically rewrite using using um, Euler's theory, if we re re if we rewrite this um, e to the i omega t um, and combine it with the sine uh, and the, the expression um, for sine of kx using uh, um, imaginary um, exponentials, then we get that this that we can rewrite psi of n um, as one over two i root two over l, and now the um, the difference between these two uh, complex exponentials. And what we notice is that each one of these exponentials is like a plane wave, a traveling wave now, but these traveling waves are going in opposite directions. This one has omega nt minus knx, and this one has omega nt plus knx. And so basically these, uh, 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 another way to think about these standing waves, these stationary states, is that there's a superposition of two traveling waves that are traveling in opposite directions and they interfere to give you these nodes and antinodes.